The one build everyone thought was impossible to make in Elden Ring has finally been made. It took one year and three months of research, countless sleepless nights, but it's here. I have finally made it. Shapeshifters are rare to find in the world of Elden Ring, mostly because shapeshifting is a practice frowned upon in the lands between and comes with a lot of risk. Those that altered their bodies to gain powerful abilities were seen as sinners and eventually all got punished by higher entities. They were collectively cursed to become these deformed, ugly monsters, devoid of any will of their own. And if that wasn't enough, they were condemned to never walk again and had to crawl the lands with their bellies. Nothing reminiscent of what they once used to be, a human with desires and capabilities. However, in the current world of the lands between, there is an individual who not only has defied the curses that have historically been placed on shapeshifters, this individual has also mastered the arts of shapeshifting to such a degree that you can safely say he's the most powerful shapeshifter of all time. He can alter parts of his body to get newfound power, in which he destroys his opponents in ways that are truly unimaginable. But don't worry, because you will get introduced to these ways today. In addition, an insanely powerful weapon that only the biggest shapeshifters in history had the skill to wield and operate with great success will also be a part of the equation. But I must admit, we have a difficult task at hand, as abilities and weapons related to shapeshifting in the game all optimize their damage output through different means and aren't necessarily that connected to each other. Which raises the question, is it even possible to make a shapeshifting build that truly captivates the game's idea of shapeshifting, where we can make it so that the different components actually synergize with each other, or will we fall flat on our face in this video and not be able to beat the game? That would be pretty humiliating and I probably have to retire if such a tragic thing would happen. But to answer that question, we need to define rules and set a challenge for this video. The rules are as following. Even though it's a difficult to optimize build, it needs to be extremely OP, so it can actually compete with my other builds. If it's not OP enough, the challenge fails and we throw the video away. We can never go over level 125, the lowest meta level, to show that the build draws its power from the build and idea itself and is actually OP. We need to defeat every boss in the game that is considered either to be difficult or a main story boss with this build. But not only that, we need to do so with a different strategy for every boss. This is to prove and show off how truly versatile and OP my shapeshifter build is. And because there is actually a good number of abilities in the game related to shapeshifting. And finally, we can only use abilities and weapons related to shapeshifting. Makes sense, right? Now what do we define as shapeshifting abilities though? We need to scope it down. The easy the easiest way to know is obviously to just check in game if your body changes when using an ability, duh. But it's actually also explicitly stated in a lot of the descriptions of various incantations. For example, all dragon community incantations contain this type of phrasing, where it's explicitly stated that you're transforming. In other words, all dragon community incantations are on the menu to use for this build. As well as Placidus Rune, by the way, which is for some reason not categorized as a dragon community incantation, even though it looks pretty dragony, so yeah. So let's start off with the dragon communion incantations. Now I'm not going to use every single one of them as we just don't have that many memory slots, but I will use Grail's Roar as an opening buff incantation that also damages our opponents. With it we get 10% extra damage versus our targets and they deal also 15% less damage to us. So a win-win situation right there with this incantation. Then I will take Dragon Mob because it's an absolutely bonkers incantation and you will see why today. From the breaths I'm going to be taking Borealis Mist or Dragon Dragon Ice if you haven't defeated Morgat yet, and Aegil's Flame as my main Dragon Breath. I'm taking these because Aegil's Flame synergizes the best with our weapons damage type and Borealis Mist is in my opinion the best dragon incantation. It applies Frostbite and deals a ton of damage, it's an insanely good incantation. I will also be taking Theodorex Magma but will be using it with less priority than the other two breaths as our weapon kind already does what this incantation does but even better. Finally, I will take Placidus X Rune as well, but since it takes 3 memory slots and is quite FP intensive, I will only be using it in one fight, but it's one very significant fight, where I do think that it performs very well. Now the other Dragon Breaths are also good, but they have less synergy with this setup specifically. In a general Dragon Community Incantation build, I would definitely use the Roth Base Breath though, as they give you a way to apply Scarlet Roth on your enemies pretty easily. However, this build is very bursty and fast paced, so applying Scarlet 
world and then accordingly waiting for it to take down the enemy's HP is just too slow for this build. Aside from the Dragon Communion incantations, following the rules we set, we can also use the Crucible incantations. And I'm going to be using the Tail based incantation here, as well as the Horns incantation. They both alter your appearance by respectively giving you a tail or a horn, and they are pretty good as well, especially when used in certain combos that you will see today. The shapeshifter's favorite hobby is playing War Thunder. He's even known to be the best War Thunder player of all time. War Thunder is easily one of the most comprehensive vehicle combat games that has ever been made, so it's definitely an impressive feat. Thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring today's video. War Thunder consists out of dynamic combined arms PvP battles where you can choose to play with over 2000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships. All these vehicles are very detailed and modeled down to their individual components. We're talking also vehicles that spawn development over 100 years from the 19th 20s all the way to present day basically and you can customize your vehicles in any way you want as well such as applying cool camouflages or even place useful 3d decorators i personally really like how much variety and customizability the game has with so many options i never got bored playing it and the best thing is you can play war thunder completely free on all these platforms to do so make sure to use my link in the description and if you register on pc there's also a large free bonus pack consisting out of multiple premium vehicles a premium account boosters and much more okay let's continue with the selection of our incantations now we have some bestial incantations that alter your body somewhat as well these are gurung's beast claw as well as the regular beast claw and as you may expect they give you claws but these incantations are just not good whatsoever their damage is horrible and you might like say okay if they come out instantly that could be okay damage but for that type of damage they also just come out way too slow so they don't make the cut as they don't comply with our rules the final option that remains that we then can use is scarlet aeonia it gives you these orange tails and makes you even become a flower completely altering your physical appearance so that's something we will be using but only for one fight since you get it really Really late in the game however this incantation is pretty good actually and gives you a relatively easy way to apply scarlet rot on any enemy therefore if you like to use it more it's a decent option for ng plus or for the upcoming dlc if you're watching this in the future and want to take the build into the dlc with incantations done we just need to solve the final piece of the puzzle which weapon do we use so there's no weapon that actually like makes you transform your body however there's one weapon in the game that is seemingly tied to shape-shifting practice Practices. It's the Magma Worm Scale Sword. Lore wise, it's the weapon used by those that were cursed for engaging in Dragon Communion practices, which is the most prolific school of incantations tied to shapeshifting in the game. Now, thankfully, the Magma Worm Scale Sword is a very good weapon with an outstanding Ash of War when used well, so that works in our favor for sure. The Ash of War has an initial hit or explosion that deals great damage. However, it also leaves this lava pool that deals good damage over time. Then if you follow up the initial hit with another input, you get this nice sweep type of attack that deals really great damage as well when you hit your enemy with it. This Ash of War is also spammable, so the damage gets really impressive really quickly, and that's exactly what we want and need for this build. You know what is really impressive as well? If you press that like button for this video, subscribe to the channel if you're still not subscribed, and make sure you hit the bell as well. Thank you. With that, we now have a good start to all the fights that are coming, spiritually speaking. I will talk about the setup of the build after the fight, so the choices make more sense. Now if you want to make this build early on or see how it works on early game bosses, I actually have a video for that as it revolves around making you OP early but it also gives you a wide selection of relevant incantations for this build at the start of a new playthrough. It is one of my first build videos ever made, so for those that have been on the channel for a long time you know exactly this video, it is a classic, check it out, link will be in the description. So let's get into it. We'll start off the fights where difficulty in the game usually starts to ramp up. So we're going to start off with the Godfrey Shade. The strategy for this fight is easy but insanely deadly. Use Aegil's Flame and Aegil's Flame only for this fight. Our fiery breath completely decimates this shade from a distance, making this fight nothing more than a formality. And it's beautiful, just look at the bright fire that engulfs the entire arena. Morgoth is next. And here we're going to use our weapon, the Magma Worm's Skill Sword. First I'm going to use Grail's Roar to get the buff and debuff going and after that it's time to properly start attacking our enemy. 
the damage starts stacking nicely and like I indicated earlier the sword really does a ton of damage even in a hybrid build like this where we are also heavily specced into our king. To really illustrate the capabilities of this weapon I'll be using it while Morgoth is phase transitioning. He takes reduced damage when transitioning as you may or may not know but as you see the sword doesn't care. The numbers get absolutely bonkers and Morgoth is another kill. For the Fire Giant, I'm going to be using the Dragon Maw only strategy. Dragon Maw is really good versus something like the Fire Giant, as he is in fact quite resistant against fire damage. Wait, what? The Fire Giant is resistant against fire damage? No way, right? So a lot of other aspects in our kit won't be as good as Dragon Maw in this fight, and Dragon Maw is this very hard hitting attack where its damage is classified as physical damage. If you don't believe me, well, the footage speaks for itself really. Every hit takes a great portion of the Fire Giant's HP, like it's absolutely nothing as you see, and you make him transition into Phase 2 quite smoothly. In Phase 2, it gets a bit harder though, as he gets increased defenses, but we can thankfully spam the incantation to get the kill until we run out of FP essentially. You see we're just spamming Dragon Maw and dealing pretty good damage. We do eventually run out of FP however as the incantation isn't really cheap. But it's no problem as he only has like 1 HP left anyway so we can just finish him off with a swing of our sword. For the Godskin Duo we are going to be using Borealis Mist, which deals magic damage as the Godskin Duo has a relatively higher resistance against fire damage. This incantation however is so good, especially in a fight like this, because we can hit both of them at the same time. And that means he has good damage, but also frostbite procs on both of them, and that is obviously the best part. Now the thing with the breaths is that you're stuck in animation when you use them, so you usually will get hit while casting your breath, which isn't usually the end of the world as the damage of these breaths is really good anyway so it kinda compensates. However in this fight we can also use the pillars as a cover up so they can't hit us when we're casting and since these incantations make us leap in the air when we cast them we can then accordingly hit them through the opening of these pillars and that is truly the dream scenario. It doesn't get any better than this and the numbers do reflect it because look at those numbers it gets very juicy. Keep casting your breath even if they're dead as it will keep counting for the overall HP bar and keep making them take damage. Then it's really time to just finish off the fight with some more casts and the rest is history. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. We killed the Godskin duo. Progressing forward we need to destroy the sentinel on the path to the next main boss. We're going to go for a deadly combo here that we haven't used yet. That is essentially burst with frostbite into a stance breaking combo with even more burst. We'll start off using Borealis Mist and just this incantation in itself will already pretty much have his HP bar. Then we'll set up for the stance break using aspects of the crucible tail into a dragon maw. The combination of these two incantations flow so well together and they deal a ton of poise damage. So naturally the sentinel will break. Then we can just chain that into another dragon maw to finish him off and the damage gets ridiculous. As you see the various shape shifting incantations have very good synergies with each other. Into Beast Clergyman and Malekith, we're going to use our weapon again, but this time really blaze up the entire arena. Beast Clergyman goes down fast, really fast, essentially at the speed of light. So make sure to not blink with your eyes, yes, yet again, to not miss anything. Then what's nice versus Malekith is that we can abuse his hyperactivity by preemptively using our sword's magma guillotine because he will jump into the magma anyways and yeah, that does really good damage. Approaching this fight with this strategy is a very good way to defeat Malekith. In Farmazula, however, we're not done yet because we also need to kill Placidusex so we can get Placidusex's rune for a later boss. This is the only fight where I'll be using Theodoric's Magma as it's a pretty good incantation for bigger bosses like Placidusex and we haven't used it yet. However, usually just using Magma Guillotine from our Magma Worm Scale Sword will be better as it's a more flexible option to get the damage in. But here in the Placidusex fight, an incantation like Theodoric's Magma also really shines. Just the initial burst and the subsequent lava that you spew out covers a very wide area which is really nice for a large sized boss like this it gives you great damage in the first phase of the fight 
After Placidus X disappears and comes back, the room for using the incantation without getting hit becomes much more narrow. However, so from my experience, it's much harder to really get the numbers in as you just saw in this phase of the fight, but it still does good damage nonetheless. You just need to find moments where Placidus X isn't actively attacking himself, then just rinse and repeat till you get him down, and eventually you will destroy this guy as well. After that, claim your reward by turning in his remembrance, get the incantation, and this little gift is going to be very useful for later. If you decide to use Theodorix Magma more intensively, you can definitely do a lot of fun things with it. It can already just one-shot enemies when used properly, however, it has this property that allows you to chain it with a follow-up attack, and this follow-up attack can be any other incantation, so a nice combo is to use Grail's Roar first, just to get the buff going, but then subsequently use Theodorix Magma, which leads into this bursty attack that does a ton of damage. And then use the follow-up window that you get to chain it with Dragon Maw. The damage gets absolutely out of this world as well just using that gun. Speaking of combos, I'm feeling another deadly combo that we haven't used so far. Gideon is the ultimate target for a beautiful combo, and what happens if you combine dragon incantations with crucible incantations? For this combo, we're going to start off with Grail's Roar as always, and then use horns to quickly get to Gideon. The hit will smash him into the ground and also do very respectable damage. Then we want to chain that with giving ourselves this nice big scary tail that we then use to continue the complete domination of Gideon with. Literally, this this poor guy gets exactly zero room to do anything in this fight. And then we finish it off with a dragon mod to completely decimate him. This fight really illustrates how beautiful and versatile the shapeshifter build can get. It allows for such cool combos. And the combos are really good, especially versus humanoid type of enemies, as the staggering and crowd control capabilities are ridiculous, in addition to the absolutely crazy damage output obviously as well, making the overall synergy between the different components just insanely lethal and powerful. Okay, the time has come to take on the first Elden Lord himself. Yes, Godfrey and thus Horalu. In this fight, I'm going to combine Dragon Maw and Magma Worm Scale Sword. It is a combo I haven't used yet, and it works insanely well in this fight. After doing a bunch of experimenting myself, I think this is a goaded combo for this fight. Reason being is that Dragon Maw gives you a lot of hyper armor and obviously deals amazing damage. And in the first phase of the fight, Godfrey simply just doesn't attack enough to get you out of your Dragon Maw animation. Dragon Maw just decimates Godfrey. You chomp and maul the first Elden Lord so hard with this incantation, it feels like you're fighting a random sewer rat. Essentially, you make him transition into phase 2 relatively easily. Dragon Maw, however, also deals a bunch of poise damage, as you may or may not know. So with my setup, by the time Godfrey transforms into Horalu, it only takes one more Dragon Maw to stance break him. Then we switch over to our weapon, get the critical hit, and use our Ash of War accordingly when he's recovering to completely erase any trace of existence from this guy. You see very well how deadly this setup is. There's no exaggeration, this is the power of the shapeshifter. Now before we go ahead and claim the Elven Throne, we're going to take a little detour. We need to head north. There are still some annoying enemies over there that we also still need to take care of. So Scarlet Ionia is an incantation we still haven't used yet, but it's the reward from killing Melania. However, I want to show the Nile kill first, because suspense, yes, suspense. You just need to wait a little bit more for the highly anticipated Melania kill as the shapeshifter. In the Nile fight, using Scarlet Ionia is so nice because it deals AoE damage, and we are facing three enemies at the same time. It's really that easy. It breaks this fight completely, and it applies Scarlet Rot on all of them. In this fight, definitely don't focus on Nile's little henchmen, however, because they will die as collateral damage when focusing on Nile himself. Scarlet Ionia deals decent damage if you actually hit your targets with it as well, but the explosion and the according Scarlet world is where it's really at. Ultimately you'll make quick work of this fight just spamming this incantation, it's as simple as that. But like I already hinted at, you do need to kill Melania first to get this incantation. Which hey, would you look at that, we're now fighting Melania. In phase 1 I will be using Borealis Mist and our weapon, the synergy between these two is amazing. Melania is weak to Frostbite as you may or may not know, well relatively weak. You can proc Frostbite relatively fast on her and our weapon deals fire damage, so we can reset the Frostbite proc quickly and get multiple Frostbite procs in one fight, which is really nice. However, like you already saw a few times before in the video, Magma Worm Scale Sword is such a good weapon. The spammable fire damage in itself is also already bonkers, and in this fight even more, as Melania does get staggered by some aspects of this Ash of War. So the damage is very good, very impressive, and very 
good. Wait, I already said that. I can't keep my excitement in check because accordingly we can go for another Frostbite proc and usually with all that insane damage in succession she will go for the Waterfall Dance. But our Boilerless Mist will in fact deny her the Waterfall Dance with a new Frostbite proc while again dealing great damage. And after that it's just a matter of one more hit and phase one is done. Now in phase 2 it is time to make a statement. I've always read that dragon breaths are too slow to use. You need to use spirit summons and blah blah blah, especially versus very fast paced bosses like Melania and even more in phase 2. But that doesn't deter the best player of all time, yours truly. I'm just kidding, I'm not that arrogant guys. But yeah, I'm the best player of all time. To kill her off with only dragon breaths in phase 2. Yes, we're going to combine Boreal's Mist and Aegil's Flame here, another combination we haven't used yet. The thing is, we can use these breaths really well actually versus Melania for the simple fact that she has a moment of where she's just recovering from her own attacks, where accordingly we can utilize our breaths to the fullest and not get hit ourselves. So obviously you don't want to use it when she's right in your face, but the best opportunities present themselves when she just did an attack and you get an opportunity to attack her with another breath. Make sure to use your fire damage by the way when she's not standing in the water. This is a little detail that I found when experimenting with various strategies and your fire damage actually does less damage when she's standing in the water. Which obviously is related to the general mechanic in the game of getting a 10% reduction in your damage output when using fire related abilities when it's raining for example. Ultimately it doesn't matter that much, you will hit her so hard anyways that she will go to her flower dive bomb ability in only like 2 casts which means even more time for you to load up another dragon breath and from that point onwards you definitely control the flow of the fight. The damage of our dragon incantations is just really good in this fight so definitely I do recommend you to use my strategy for this if you are struggling to take her down and you will ultimately just destroy her completely. After killing Melania, it is time to go back to the capital and move towards the Elven Throne and claim it. Radican is very weak against fire damage, so for this fight you already know what we're going to do. We're going to go all out on fire damage, using both our weapon as well as Aegil's Flame for the ultimate fire combo. And we haven't even used this combo yet. Starting off with Aegil's Flame already like halves Radican's HP from a distance, which is kind of funny because we can then just finish off the fight with our sword and from that point onwards it goes very fast. We bathe Radican in fire essentially and the poor guy has exactly 0.0% chance of winning this fight. You can see how oppressive we are even in the destruction of the fire damage we are still sense breaking him as well by the way but it doesn't matter because he's already dead. Now there are still abilities in our kit that we haven't even used yet. That is how insanely versatile the shapeshifter build is and I'm talking about Placidus X Rune, yes. And I kept it for the Elden Beast. Reason being, in the Elden Beast fight this thing is an absolute monster. It is just art. Here, have a moment and just enjoy the beauty of the destruction in this fight. Alright, so you saw how we defeated every boss in a different way as the shapeshifter. Essentially showing how versatile this build is, you can just do it all and have a solution to any problem that is presented to you with the gift of altering your physical appearance to get convenient powers to defeat different types of enemies. But the question arises, with so many different elements in the kit of the shapeshifter, can we actually optimize it? And if yes, how do we truly optimize it? Well, the best way I've found to do so is using this stat distribution that I came up with after experimenting with a bunch of different stat distributions. And I truly think this is the ultimate stat distribution for this build. As you see, we're only level 125. But we do have a three-way stat split in Arcane, Faith and Strength. That is because on one hand, our seal scales with Arcane and Faith, while our sword, on the other hand, mostly scales with Faith and Strength. And you might think, but does that then not result into you gimping your own damage out? No, not really. And let me illustrate why. See, for this build we want to use the Dragon Communion Seal, as it gives the vast majority of our incantations, the Dragon Communion incantations, a nice innate bonus of 15% to their damage output. But the Dragon Communion Seal has this particular unique soft cap, where its damage is soft cap at 45 Arcane and 30 Fate, providing us the means to optimize for its damage output with relatively low stats, and it also makes it actually one of the best weapons in the game that actually fits the idea of a hybrid Build. As you see, we in fact reach both these soft caps with our stats, so seal-wise we are all good. 
The weapon, the Magma Worm Skill Sword, however, doesn't have any scaling with our 45 Arcane. And you might think, well, for the damage of the sword, that is wasted points then, right? Again, not really. Reason being is because Magma Guillotine of the Magma Worm Skill Sword scales with AR. Like the actual blast and most of the damage of this thing is all dependent of our AR. With this setup and stat distribution, we have 706 AR and that is with only 30 strength. Now, if you reach the soft cap for strength in a hybrid build as well in your stats, so say you get like 60 strength you would get 807 AR so that is 30 extra levels for like only 100 extra AR that is nothing if you think about it we sacrifice this 100 AR to get an extremely versatile build that is very fun but also very powerful the magma worm scale sword on 706 AR already deals absolutely bonkers damage as you saw in the video so there's no need to fully invest in strength either way in my opinion the incredible damage that this weapon deals with relatively low stats and how accordingly you don't get much from even 30 extra full levels makes me think the developers want us to use this for hybrid builds. Only important thing here obviously is to upgrade your magma worm skills for 2 plus 10 which is relatively easy anyways even very early on in your playthrough as you might know if you watched my get op early guides. This weapon having the opportunity to be upgraded with somber smithing stones is a huge bonus. So weapon and seal wise we are covered. We have a beautiful hybrid build that works amazing with these stats and like I said we are not high level at all. You then want to spend the remainder of the points in vigor. We need at least 40 vigor. Yes it is a bit on the low side but we do reach the first soft cap on vigor at least and it's not that important to have 60 vigor with this build because our burst is insane. We can kill something off before it even touches us most of the time. And then endurance and mind like this gives us good opportunities to actually use everything in our kit that consumes FP and gives us good stamina and also gives us the opportunity to wear an armor set that gives us over 51 poise and just good thematically fitting armor which reduces a big portion of the incoming damage so on the defensive side of things it is very nice which brings me to the next point you'll want to run these four armor pieces the silver tear mask the drake knight armor and drake knight gauntlets and the veteran streams now this brings us over that 50 poise threshold which means we can resist hits that potentially could interrupt our our casts which is especially nice when casting incantations that have a long animation like the dragon incantations so definitely a very very useful threshold to meet for this build in particular our mask however makes things even better because it gives us a whopping eight points in arcane which also contributes to the very nice set attribution that we have going here for this three-way hybrid build that only level 125 and makes us reach that 45 arcane. Yes, I keep saying level 125 and that it's very low, but it's to reiterate the epicness of this build. Talismans you can go a lot of ways. If you don't want to bother with swapping around, then these four talismans are probably going to be your best generic overall setup. Shard of Alexander for our weapons as you for, that's 15% extra damage, absolutely put it in there. Roar's Medallion, which now finally works with dragon breaths so definitely consider using it because it gives our dragon breaths a significant boost fire scorpion charm because we have multiple sources of fire damage in our kit and then finally the flock canvas talisman to boost all our incantations now if you want to play like me and use certain strategies for certain bosses here are some talismans you want to consider using as well the magic scorpion charm instead of the fire scorpion charm when using boilers mist only for a fight faithful canvas talisman instead of shard of alexander if you're going to only use incantations for a fight and if you want more tankiness then the dragon crest rachel talisman is always a great option i didn't really bother to swap around things and really optimize it to this degree for every fight i just used the generic setup for everything really and as you saw our damage output was always absolutely amazing for the flask of wonders physic it is easy get the flame shrouding crack tier to boost our fire damage some more like the damage of our weapon but also a gills flame which already has great base damage and then either the fate not crystal tier or the strength not crystal tier i use the fate not crystal tier in some fights so we can easily meet the requirements for plus two six rune for instance but generally i like to use the strength not crystal tier more since our seal is already soft capped on fate and our weapon gets the most additional ar from strength at this point so using the strength not crystal tier as a second crystal tier will benefit us the most it is about 40 extra ar from just taking a sip from our flask so definitely a nice bonus and with that you now know everything to become an actual shapeshifter in elder ring that is completely overpowered and destroys absolutely everything also make sure to check out War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game of all time. This action packed game is waiting for you right now. You'll get a huge bonus pack with all kinds of cool stuff if you use my link in the description.